Need a little bit of homework there. Uh, I seem like a way far away from you. I'd like to move closer, but I'd probably get in trouble. Because uh, it seems like I'm way back here and you're way back there. I'd like to talk to you this morning uh, on the topic of building a godly prophetic life. Are you into that? Do you want that? You can have that. Let me inform you, you have it. I'll prove it to you in this text. This July, the people of Russia celebrate a hundred year anniversary for a tragic event that happened in their country. Uh, for 300 years, up until 1918, Russia had been uh, ruled by czars. Um, and their political philosophy uh, has been influenced by two, two, at least two major invasions that happened to the Russian people that have influenced the way they, the way they think politically. The first was uh, through Kublai Khan and uh, Genghis Khan when they swept across Asia and into Europe and into Russia and left their print uh, on those people. And the second invasion came from the north was the Vikings who swept in from the north to establish trade routes all through Russia and into Europe because they wanted to trade all the way to Asia. The way that those two countries influenced Russia was um, that they were both guided by what is known as autocratic control. That is, all decisions are made up here. You have no opinion down there. It's those guys who are at the top who make all the decisions. And this was coupled with another political philosophy that actually had started three or 400 BC by philosoph uh, Greek philosophers like Plato. And that came to be known as, by the time it got to Europe and the way that they, they looked at it, was called the divine right of kings. So it was a political philosophy that said, God has borne you into the social class that you're in, and he's borne me into the social class that I am in, and we will stay in that class till the day we die. That's okay if you're born into a nobility, or if you're a czar. <laughs> it's not very much fun when you're born a peasant because a peasant doesn't even own any land. He just works for a landlord to get a certain percentage off the crop. And so, um, at times, the czars of Russia had a little difficulty implementing this philosophy, um, this autocratic concept, this uh, divine right of kings, because every once in a while somebody would wake up and say, hey, enough is enough, I'm, I don't like this start a rebellion, but because the government ruled the military, armed the military, managed the military, they could put down any rebellion that came along. And then the czars clicked into another concept that helped them keep order the way they wanted, and that was they established a secret police. So that the secret police could find out who those rebels are before the rebellion started. And they had the power to go and arrest you, take you in the backyard and shoot you, do whatever needed to be done so you don't mess up the czar's wonderful order of things. So you can see this went on for 300 years. By the time you get to 1917, the czar in power is Nicholas II. His wife is Alexandra. They have five children. And Nicholas has bought into this, all this philosophy. This is the way he has been running his empire. This is the way his ancestors. Michael Romanov became the first Romanov czar in 1613, and it had been that way right down to Nicholas's time. 
and he saw no point and changed it. He thought that was a great philosophy. Well, you can see where that kind of a philosophy would lead you. It doesn't open you up to the possibility of land reform, of universal education or medical treatment. Hey, you're born to that. You live and die in that. That's what's God's will for you. This is God's will for us guys. You know, we can afford some of that stuff. And that's the way we run it here. And Nicholas just didn't realize how angry the people out in the country were about all of this. And finally, in 1917, a rebellion got started that his military nor his secret police could stop. It was the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. It swept right across Russia. Most of the Russians said, we have had it. We do not like this system. We do not want this system. We're finished with this system. Nicholas, he had no vision. He never saw it coming. He didn't see the unrest. He didn't see the unfairness that was happening in his empire. He was a nominal Russian Orthodox Christian. But he wasn't reading the same Bible that I read because that's not my Jesus. He cared for the poor. He sacrificed for the poor. He didn't put himself above the average person. And so even though he was a very religious man, he didn't really know God. He didn't have a vision for God for his country. And he was totally shocked when this revolution happened. And so he thought, oh, well, I'll just abdicate and go live in the country. Take it easy. He didn't realize that if you go out in the country, Nicholas, they're going to hate you. <laughs> Why are you going to go and live out there? But he, he just didn't realize the true situation. And so he abdicated and moved for a number of places over a year's period. He could have left Russia. He had relatives in Germany. He had relatives in England. His wife's grandmother was Queen Victoria of England. He could have easily moved over there. But he just thought, this is the motherland. I will stay and enjoy the countryside until July the 17th, 1918. A group of Bolshevik revolutionaries entered his house, shot him, his wife, and his five kids took them to a forest, buried them, threw lime on them, tried to get rid of the evidence. That was the end of the Romanovs. This July celebrates 100 years since that incident happened. It took 20 years before the Russian government would even tell their people what had happened because they were embarrassed about it. So I'm sharing this story with you because it has a point. <laughs> uh, you know, we can live like a Nicholas, just ignorant of what really is going on around us. Really have no, no vision of what God's plan for you is. No gumption that God may have something he wants you to do. And that I, try, I should try to engage in him and find out what that might be so that I can live a life that honors him. And so we kind of have a choice. We can let life come to us and we follow it by the circumstances that come our way and we live and we die according to what comes our way and how life treats us. Or we can ask God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? Where do you want me to do it? Because God has a kingdom. He has work on this earth that he wants to do. And part of his plan is for us redeemed people to join him in his plan. It's an amazing plan. Why would somebody do that with rascals like us? But that's God. He said, I want you guys on board. Help me out with this. Let's take this message to the world. Well, in this part of the world, the message is failing and failing badly. We do not want to be one of those kind of people. So... There's an, an excellent example of how you and I should be listening to what God is saying to us 
and try to adjust our lives to fit in with what God might want. This takes place in the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse 1. Let me read the text to you. By the way, this is Jacob. He's almost ready to die. He's been 17 years in Egypt. Joseph got them into Egypt. All his family have moved there. He's been there 17 years. He knows he's about to die. But he knows he has some rascals of sons who have not really been living for God. Even though they claim God as their God, there are things about his, their lives that he's not really comfortable with. And so he's concerned about their future. Where is that kind of an attitude going to lead them? And so he prays to God, and the Spirit of God gives him this prophetic message for each of those sons. And this is the message. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you <clears throat> in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Now he's going to go through the 12 sons. See where you fit in. Reuben, the eldest. You are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, but turbulent as waters. You will no longer excel, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. <clears throat> Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they please. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son, like a lion he couches and lies down, like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nation is his, nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. His border will extend toward Sidon. Issachar is a raw-boned donkey lying down between two saddlebags. When he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a serpent by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its riders tumbles back, tumble backwards. I looked for your deliverance, O Lord. Verse 19, Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. Asher's food will be rich. It will provide delicacies fit for a king. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring, whose branches climb up over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber. Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your Father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you, with blessings of the heaven, with the heavens above, blessings of the deep that lie below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your Father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. And lastly, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. I don't know about you, but 
Every once in a while, I'll read a chapter in the Bible, and I scratch my head, and I say, what was that all about? <laughs> that ever happened to you? No, you and I ever have that problem. <laughs> well, this one comes close to that. What is he talking about here? It seems like a very mixed up, convoluted message. Well, it's prophetic. And so it's going to tell us a lot about the prophetic. As a matter of fact, this may be the linchpin text for understanding the prophetic in the rest of the Bible. If we can get this one right, it's going to help us with the prophetic through the rest of the Bible. But let me say, before I talk any more about the prophetic, let me suggest there are two or three things that the prophetic is not. The prophetic is not fortune-telling. Watch out, this is going to happen to you tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Bang. That's not prophecy. That's fortune-telling. That's some demonic spirit hoping to dump a ladder on you when you walk under it to accommodate your foolish belief. So the prophetic is not fortune-telling. It's not fatalism. It's not like God has created you to be this, like a peasant in Russia. This is what you were born into. This is who you are. And this is where you'll die. That's not prophetic. That's not the way God treats us. Rather, the prophetic comes mainly with three messages. Promises with blessings. Consequences for past actions. And warnings about us if we don't change. Pretty, three pretty simple concepts, but three we need to really grasp. And so, when God offers prophetic blessings, they always come with conditions. He doesn't arbitrarily drop out nuggets of great blessing to the people whom he may happen to like today. That's not the way he does it. His concept is to bless all of us. But we all face the same promises. We all face the same rules of the game. And it depends how we have played the game. It depends whether we have fulfilled the conditions that he lays down to receive his blessings. And so as you can see, when it comes to the prophetic, one of the greatest persons who has an input into the prophetic message from my life is Carl Ruby. This is where it starts. God has his part, don't worry. But as we go through this text, you're going to see it's guys like Carl Ruby who lay the foundation for the life, the prophetic life that God has for me. And you're no different. So the first one, let's go to the first one. The first one in verse 3 to 4, I won't read the text again. If you have your Bible, you can follow it. Uh, Reuben is the firstborn. The firstborn is, ha, has the right to what is called the double portion of the birth inheritance. He is supposed to get a double portion being the eldest son. The other thing about Reuben is probably Jacob hoped when he had his first son, his only son, and he, as far as he knew, the, the last son he was going to have, he hoped that through that son the Messiah would be born. That it would be through that tribe the Messiah would come. Well, as we read from the text, and if you go earlier in Genesis, you found, find out that Reuben messed up. He went and had sex with one of Jacob's other wives. The maid to one of his wives, who he, he did marry, was a wife as well. And so if you go through the text, you find out that he lost his birthright. The double portion went to Joseph. And as we know, the Messiah did not come through the line of Reuben. So why? I mean, God doesn't just pick perfect people to do things. So how come Reuben is being singled out from an event that happened so long ago? I rather suspect that Reuben repented of that event, that he really felt bad about it. But I think the message that God is saying is Reuben... Yes, you felt bad, you repented of that incident, but Reuben, you have yet to go deep enough to find out why you fell into that. 
Why is it so easy for you to fall into those cravings and follow through with them and take action on them? Yes, you can say, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, I repent. That's a good issue, but that's not the most basic issue. The most basic issue is how, where did this thing come from? Why was it so easy for me to do that when I knew it was wrong? So I think Jacob is saying to Reuben, Reuben, you still have some work to do. God is not saying that because you're not going to be in the Messianic line that there's nothing you can do. But you're not going to be able to do what I would have liked you to have done and maybe what God would have liked you to have done. Because there are consequences to my life. Now I can change. And God still has work for me to do. A good work. But some things I will not be able to do because of the way I messed up in some places and sometimes. So I think with, with Reuben, the issue is, Reuben, there's still stuff to deal with. And I hope you deal with it because I want you to be part of the calling on my people. But unless you change, you can pass those concepts down to your children who may act the same way that you acted. And it's certainly through the, not through those kind of people that I will be sending my Messiah. I think that's the message to Reuben. We don't know if he got it or not. I believe he got most of it because he's still hanging in there 200 years when they go, later when they go into the land of Canaan. One of the plots of land is dedicated to Reuben. So he did get to do something. God just didn't throw us out because we make a mistake. It's what we do with the mistake that matters. Then he goes to verse 5 to 7 is Simeon and Levi. Carl, you are going to have to hurry up. Simeon and Levi. And here, again, we have a prophetic warning against these two, two brothers. If you will go back in Genesis, you'll recall that these are the two brothers whose sister, stupidly, went dancing out into the public party to a celebration that was hand, being handled by idolater, idolater worshippers, and she got raped. And so these two brothers played a trick on the people of that town and ended up murdering every man and every boy in the town. Jacob says, I want nothing to do with people like that who operate that way. He wasn't condoning what the Shechemites did. But he said, you have made me a foul smell to the people of Canaan by the way you've treated this. You didn't do it with justice. And I think if the issue was raised yet for the very same reason as it was raised with Reuben. I don't think they had yet dealt with what was still something in their heart that could again lead them to use violence could lead them to use robbery, could use them to maybe not with a sword, but murder people in other ways. They, they were part of the people of God and they accepted God, but there were issues in their life that unless they were dealt with, are going to get them into trouble down the road. So Jacob is saying, boys, deal with your past by dealing with the root cause of it. Where did it come from? And the consequence is, sadly, he says, when we do get into the land of Canaan, you're going to be scattered. Simeon never did get a piece of property in the land of Canaan. And nor did Levi, even though that was the tribe that Moses came from and Aaron came from. They were Levites. But they never owned any property. So you see, there's consequences to my decisions. That affects my prophetic future. Doesn't mean I'm washed up. Doesn't mean God's throwing me on the trash heap. But there are things he would have liked to have done with me that he cannot do now because I crossed some line and took myself out of what he would have wanted to do. So son number two and son number three could not also bring forth the Messiah because I think they still had work to do and they were not ready yet to do it. They did make it in, so they did do something. 
how much we don't know. We then come to the fourth son, who is Judah, in verses 8 to 12. Now, in this case, we know, if you read, read your New Testament, that that is the line through whom the Messiah came, the tribe of Judah. But if you read Judah's history, you read that he had some blotchy parts to his life too. Judah left home and when he was a teenager, he went out and married a Canaanite, which his parents said, do not do because they are idol worshippers and they'll drag you into idol worshippers and your children will worship idols, so don't go there. Well, he was a rebellious teenager and went and did what he wanted. Married a Canaanite, had three sons, two of them died, and he promised the widow of one, his third son, but he backed down and refused to come true to his word, so she posed as a prostitute, had sex with him, and had a son. That's Judah. At some point, Judah woke up and said, this is not right. I am going back home. I am going to face the music. I am going to change my life and walk the way God wants me to walk. And he returned home. Big transformational change took place in Judah's life. But not only that incident, if you go to chapters uh, 43 to 46, you read a lot about Judah. In those two chapters, Judah becomes the real leader of the 12 boys. It comes out when Joseph is in Egypt and he's demanded that their youngest son Benjamin be brought down. Jacob doesn't want him to go because he's afraid he's going to lose him. Judah steps forward, he says, I will raise my honor, hand in honor and promise you that I will bring that boy back home if we go down there. We have to go down and get food. And he stepped forward and said, I will be responsible for him. But not only that, when they get to, to uh, Egypt and Benjamin is falsely accused for stealing Joseph's cup, and Joseph says, okay, he's going to be my slave, that was the deal. Benj or Judah stepped forward and said, no, I will become your slave. Please let the boy go back to his father, because if he doesn't go back, it will kill him. Judah becomes the first picture of what later comes to be called a kinsman redeemer. That is someone who is willing to sacrifice their life for the benefit of somebody else takes place in the book of Ruth. Kinsman Redeemer is an ideal picture of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, who sacrificed his life so that we could have life. So you see, a great transformation has taken place in Judah's life. I think Judah went right to the root causes of why he went the way he went. And he didn't want to stay that way, and he didn't want to go back to that way, or go any other way that would dishonor God. And finally, God says, this is the tribe through whom the Messiah will come. Because here I see a man who's been willing to deal with the prime causes of what led him to do the things that he did. Also, there's the component of foreknowledge that these people had nothing to do with. But God, in his foreknowledge, when the time of the Messiah was going to come, he wanted that child to be born I mean, into parents who would raise him the way God would want him to be raised. And through the tribe of Judah came people called Joseph and Mary, whom the Bible says were righteous. And so not only did Judah choose God, but Mary and Joseph chose God. And God, in his foreknowledge, knew that there would be people in Judah's line that when the right time came, would be true believers and he could trust them with his son. And so Jesus was born through Mary and Joseph, who were from the tribe of Judah. We'll go a little quicker now. Time's running out. And I'll just kind of briefly mention some of the rest. Verse 13 is Zebulun. It prophesies that this will be a tribe of merchants. At that time, by the time 200 years are to go yet in Egypt before they get out of Egypt, but when they do get out, on the coast, uh, the, the uh, west coast of Israel, the Mediterranean, up into Lebanon, that was the main trading route of the world at that time. The caravans came from China, and that was the terminal point uh, on the coast there. 
and the, uh, the, Tyre, the people of Tyre controlled all of the seas of the Mediterranean, all the way out into the Atlantic. And so um, these Jewish people, the, um, or are we Zebulun tribe, would uh, be great world traders. And so what I think God is saying is, hey, it's okay for my people to be business people. It's okay for my people to get involved in the world and do business. But don't forget to also be involved in my kingdom. Don't get to worship your business. I'll let you succeed in your business. I want to see you succeed. But be very careful because you can begin to worship your business. And your business can start to control you. There's nothing wrong with doing business. The next one we read of Issachar. Issachar comes with a warning. Issachar is going to experience abundance, great benefits. But the danger is that he may fall into living only for the good life. I think this is probably the problem for most Canadians. We've got the good life. Why would we need God? We've got medical treatment. We've got unemployment insurance if we get out of a job. We've got ODSP if we get sick. Hey, we've got everything covered. We don't need God. We've got this. Very easy to fall into that when the life is going well. And so he's warning the tribe of Issachar, don't fall into that trap. Because to be involved in God's kingdom means you're going to be involved in a struggle. It's going to be a fight to stand up for God, to fight for God, to dedicate your time for God, to sacrifice time and effort for the kingdom. It's going to be very easy to say, oh, after a day's work, I just want to go home and relax. Oh, no time for worship and prayer. Go to a Bible study? Oh, I'm too tired. Besides, my favorite TV program is on TV tonight. Why would I do that? Yeah, just take the good life. Go live with it. I'd rather do some extra overtime. I'd get some extra money, buy that boat. I don't know, whatever it is. But it's always a temptation. Uh, Gad is our next man, verse 19. And here it's told that he's being attacked but God approves of him retaliating and chasing the enemy out. So what I think God is saying is that it's okay to use force if necessary in a difficult situation. If a robber breaks through your house, are you going to let him assault your wife? Or are you going to take the nearest baseball bat and give him a, a hit? <laughs> yes, we are supposed to pray for our enemies. But that doesn't mean we let our enemies steamroller over us. And then there's Asher in verse 20. Here again, there's a plug for the trades. In this case, they're going to be chefs. They're going to make such food that kings will love to eat what they cook. So again, God is approving of the trades. But again, don't let the trade become your idol. Just because you're good at it, can do well at it, succeed great at it. That doesn't mean I shouldn't be sacrificing for the kingdom and living for God the way he wants me to do it. And then we have Naphtali in verse 21. Strange picture. It's a picture of a deer, a doe, with two fawns, period. What is that talking about? Well, you know what I think it says? I know it came on TV the other night. Somebody um, put one of those pictures, or maybe it was Colleen on her Facebook. A mother doe with one fawn. What a picture of innocence, of beauty, a peace. You know, when a man or a woman or a family honors God, they are a picture of beauty to God. The closest we have in the Old Testament is Solomon when he's at his height of glory. And the Queen of Sheba, a foreigner, a Gentile, comes to visit him. And she is awestruck when she sees that temple, his palace, the abundance of gold and silver, the fine way his servants are dressed, the great education he's giving to his people. She says, oh, this is God. Well, that's what people, God wants people to think about us. When they look at our lives, is it a picture of wonder, a picture of beauty, a picture of what people themselves might want out of life? 
Or do they just see a mess? Problems, difficulties. Oh, don't want to be part of that. That's not God's ideal. He wants us to be a picture of beauty to the world. Verse 22 to 26, we're going to go fast because this is Joseph and the longest part of the blessing goes to Joseph for good reason, right? We know Joseph's history and this is where we get the great teaching that what the way I've lived in the past is going to have a big input on the, my prophetic future. Joseph was the most blessed of the, all the brothers. He served God the greatest and he gets the greatest blessing. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. You live for God, he will bless you. He wants to bless you. He'll give you the double portion. If you live a life honor to him. Joseph did it from the time he was 17 to the time we meet him in his 30s and 40s in, in Egypt. Every instant he lives for God. And his two sons get the double portion that was supposed to go to Reuben. And they are so blessed when they get into the land that it becomes a proverb in Israel. If you have the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh, man, you've got it. You get the greatest material blessing that you can think about. And they got the largest territory. They had the most people living in their territory. They were the wealthiest of all the other tribes. But remember, a material blessing is not the best blessing. Because you find that those are the two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, were the first two tribes to fall into idol worship. That's what money can do to you. And they went into exile a hundred years before the rest of Israel went into exile. So yeah, the material blessing is great, but it's not the best. And it can, it can actually be the most dangerous. I think it's in one of the Proverbs. It says, I'm blessed if I just have enough food on my table to feed me so that I don't have to go out and beg, but I have enough so that I don't have to worry about trying to protect all my wealth. I'll just be content with what God has given me. Yes, God wants to bless us. He wants us to have material blessings. But just remember, there's great danger in material blessing and success. It's very few men and women of God who can live for God with a lot of wealth. It's a hard job. And it's a dangerous job. We come to the last one. And that's his brother uh, Benjamin. Again, he's called a wolf. Doesn't seem very nice. Poor old Benji. How did that happen? Well, because God knew his heart. It would seem to me that there was something in Benjamin's heart that could lead him to acting that way. We have two examples that show it to us. Two Benjamites, descendants of Benjamin. The first one was King Saul, a Benjamite. Uh, he was a real wolf. He never walked with God truly. He took from others. He was more concerned about the way he looked and presented himself. The other Benjaminite, Benjamite that we know about, his name was also Saul. I think he dealt with his past. And his name got changed from Saul to Paul and became the Apostle Paul. He was also a Benjamite. But I think Paul dealt with, you know, as a wolf, he went out and was killing Christians. Till one day he woke up and said, what am I doing? Is that really God? And he went and dealt with the reasons why it was so easy for him to do that. It had to have its roots somewhere. And he dealt with it. It took him 14 years before he actually became an apostle. He took his time. He worked through his life. Working through our life never ends. It's a lifelong journey. But i got to get started. And i got to stay on the journey. If the job is going to get done. But you and I have already laid a prophetic foundation as to what God would say to you today. A prophet may come along and tell you wonderful things about yourself, some of which may be true and some of it may be made up. But God knows the truth. When Samuel went to anoint the next king of Israel, God said, go to the house of Jesse. He's got seven sons. I'm going to pick one of them for the next king. And when 
Samuel saw those first six boys, he thought, wow, I could pick any one of these. Look at the size. Look how smart they are. Look at the wealth these guys have. Oh, this will not be a problem. God said, Samuel, shut up. I don't look at the outward part of a person. I look at the heart. So we can fool a lot of people by the way we look. But what's in our hearts that God sees, that's what influences God's prophetic message over you and me. It's what really has happened and is happening and will happen in our hearts. Otherwise, we're going to live with the foundation we've built this far. And if there's been negative stuff, there will be negative consequences. But I can stop those consequences by changing, by inviting Jesus into my life and being willing to deal with what led, the, what led me to do this. Yes, the event was not right. I repent of that. That's only part of the problem. The real issue is, why was it so easy for me to do that? That's what I need to deal with. Because if I don't deal with that, I'll do this in some other way. Just different. So, you and I are the one most responsible for the prophetic foundation that we have laid. We don't have to stay the way we are. I'm not insinuating that you all need radical change, but most of us do. There's not many here that don't. And God knows that. And in his love, he's provided a way for us to deal with our past, to stay tuned into him, keep our hearts right before him, plug into his kingdom, no matter what our trade or occupation is. Remember that the kingdom comes first. What can I do for the kingdom of God? What am I sacrificing for the kingdom of God? How am I living for Jesus today? And Jesus is the only perfect model that there is in the Bible for all of that. So I want to close with a prayer. If I can find it. A prayer of commitment. If you're ready to do that, if you want to do that, that's between you and God. The prayer, you can say it to yourself. You can say it out loud. You can do whatever way you want to do with it. Um, but most of all, what do you want to do in your heart? That's the real issue. Father, I thank you that I do not have to live under the fear of fatalism. I thank you that you have a prophetic life of blessing that you want me to live. Therefore, today, I choose to commit my life to building a solid prophetic foundation upon which you can build my life. Give me the courage to bring to death every area of my life that dishonors you. And give me the strength to daily choose your spiritual truths so that I can be a valuable member of your kingdom, which will allow others to see Jesus living in me. Come, Holy Spirit, and stamp these things on my heart today. For I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.